Uh, let's see. So Josh the N Josh the NES nerd says I played a little bit uh, with Incarnate. I made a few world maps that I used in my campaign. And Wolfie, if you have any questions on it, let me know. If, if they're not answered in the video, or if they're not answered just by looking at the map itself, uh, or the supporting documents, uh, make sure if you go back and take a look at that in our Discord, look at the prompts that we generated on a document that led to then the map creation. The maps that you see, whether it's a dungeon or an outdoor region or an underground region, were made after we produced a document that is the foundation for the concept of the map. All right, well, uh, not that we can't talk about this. We can talk about maps and other things as much as you'd like. I, I do want to move on and look at the monk as it is presented in this Eberron supplement. Um, so again, look, PHB, the monk is, boom, three sections, a couple paragraphs in each. You know, and for many, that is enough to, that that's what you need. Yeah, yeah, no, no, Wolfie, don't think you're distracting. This is, a, this is all table talk. This is fun. You want to do a campaign without a map drawn at first, and if the players want to have a map, they'll have to draw one as they explore the world. That's an excellent way to have them engage with the world, Josh. I would recommend it. The monks of Corvale, Corvair, hail from the Adoran tradition of the Tashalatora, to Doldorn's Order of the Broken Blade. This introduction explores the monastic traditions found across Corvair. Professor Haas Holen will guide you through the varied philosophies of these fascinating sects, while Professor Talai demonstrates their martial techniques. So here we are, we've moved on from Martial Arts 103 to Martial Arts uh, 1105. Uh, and as we're taking our college course here. Wizards harness mystical power through the study of arcane science. A cleric is a vessel that entreats for the aid of divine forces. Those who study the fighter's disciplines harden their bodies and minds through purposeful repetition. The monk walks a step in each of these shoes. Beginning with a foundation of mental and physical discipline, a monk channels energy to force an impossible action to become possible from moving with superhuman speed to striking with fists of flame. The sorcerers persuade the ambient energies all around them to do their bidding, while the monk focuses power within them and becomes a conduit with the strictest discipline. The monasteries of Arion are some of the finest libraries in the Five Nations. Now, okay, so this is getting into, uh, sorry, this is getting into a lot of lore, Eberron lore. I'm skipping over this because I want you to support the, you know, I want you to buy this and support the creator. But also, if you like Eberron, the fluff will give you a, well, it'll give you a lot of lore. It'll take you into the, the workings, the political, the religious, the philosophical uh, foundations and moving parts of Eberron. Uh, monastic traditions. Uh, so yeah, this is getting into different ways to look at some of the abilities. For example, initiate of the flayed hand strips the flesh across the body and then treats the muscle below with an alchemical substance that toughens and heals it. This process is an aspect of their unarmored defense. So unarmored defense, we can have a broad concept of this is this brings you into the world. This is why you have unarmored defense. It's a generic placeholder name for the mechanics. And we are simply saying, we're giving a different name for how you achieve those mechanics. Hi, Rykon. We are exploring the Morgrave Miscellany expansion to Eberron 5th edition. You, well, there are D&D &D adventures on Audible. I have a good collection of them, Wolfie. But if you're talking about rules books, I don't know. That, may, that might be a kind of... That might be kind of difficult to navigate through. You're making your players draw roads and stuff. So if an NPC says, hey, city here, I'll add that, but I won't draw a road, that, uh, that's up to, for them to perceive. That, that hooks them in. It makes them be very aware of their circumstances, not to take it for uh, granted. After learning to endure pain, the next teachings focus on how to inflict it. The monks of the flayed hand are master torturers and deadly warriors. 
communing with the mockery through murder and deception. Most monks of the Flayed Hand employ the Way of Atonement. That's in Xanathar's Lost Notes. Or the Way of Shadow. So we're, th this is the flavor to bring these aspects into Eberron. How you can conceive them to exist. All kinds of wonderful fluff. And by the way, this is to prepare you as a DM that if you have a character, if you have a player that wants to take Eberron content in your homebrew, I suggest you read this to understand perhaps any roleplay limitations that should be coming with the powers that are present because there's an intended way for them to be used. Uh, and also, this makes you think, just like the others, you know, can you have a monk without a discipline, right? Just as a barbarian needn't be a savage, a monk needn't be tied to a monastic order. A monk is characterized by their inner strength, remarkable speed, and martial abilities that improve over time. A monk's increasing unarmed damage generally reflects improved skill, but as a warforged monk, it could literally reflect your fist evolving into deadlier weapons. Uh, consider, it, uh, consider the following ideas. You're a living weapon. Um, you're a mage-bred warrior. The dragon-marked house Vidalis is renowned for mage breeding, which employs mystical techniques to imbue animals with enhanced physical abilities. According to the house, they've never successfully applied these techniques to humans, yet during the last war, the house certainly attempted to produce mystical warriors. You could be the product of this. You don't have to be to, uh, you, don't, you don't have to belong to a monastic tradition. You could just be a master spy. You could be this primal champion where you're tapping into, you know, the your own self, you know, the product of your environment. So if we're creating a character, let's roll a d8 and look at a, a sort of a, another trait that uh, this character could have, a four. You seek to suppress all emotion and maintain perfect calm. So we're taking kind of a Mr. Spock approach. This is a fun way to make a monk that's different than just a generic monk in the player's handbook. Because remember, the player's handbook, the DMG and the monster manual all have certain suppositions, right? There's a, there's a base assumption about what is going on in the world in which these rules are presented. Here is the, no, I was about to say the multi-class. Here's the subclass for monk that is presented in this uh, miscellany. Oh, King says, speaking of punching people to death in a fantasy setting, I'm making a dude puncher in a historic campaign with realistic wounds. Is this the uh, the Wuja, uh, or the, uh, what, the Song of Swords uh, campaign that you were talking about that you're going to be joining? I know you said you wanted to be a Martian in it, and everyone else is playing a Frenchman in an ancient Japanese setting. Kind of hard to read. It's why I enjoy listening. Oh, yeah. Wolfie... That's another uh, aspect uh, that I like presenting uh, this workshop in, is that you can just sit back and listen. You can be working, you could be driving. This is like a radio show, except you get to see my beautiful face in the, in the, sm in the wee little corner. Now we have an albino samurai, a mountain man, so it's getting a bit more believable. A little itty bitty bit more. Oh, you think so, Coffee Cat? Well, thank you very much. I'm getting kind of scruffy though. I'm gonna have to. I'm gonna have to trim up a little bit. I'm afraid. Plus, this is uh, this is starting to filter my water for me, ever so slightly. But uh, thank you for the compliment, Coffee. All right, the Argent Fist uses key energy to channel radiant power, healing the injured and blasting unclean creatures. This tradition was first mastered by followers of the Silver Flame, and the Silver Forge has a number of fortress monasteries spread across Thrain. However, an Argent Fist could also be a champion of Dol Ara, a Goshkala Orc, or even a Warforge to built to battle the undead. So we're going to get four subclass features here because monks get a ton of stuff for being a monk. Your subclass is just sort of like a fun little splash into something. Balm of the Flame. 
Starting when you choose this tradition at third level, you can harness your key to rekindle the flame represented within all life. You have a well of cleansing flame that replenishes when you take a long rest. With that well, you can restore a total number of hit points equal to your monk level multiplied by your wisdom modifier. As an action, you can touch a creature and spend one key point to draw power from that well to restore a number of hit points to the creature up to the maximum amount remaining in your well. This feature improves when you reach 11th level when you can spend one key point and five hit points from your well of cleansing flame to uh, end one effect that's causing the creature to be charmed or frightened. You can cleanse multiple effects with a single use of Balm of the Flame, expending hit points separately for each one. The healing effects of this feature have no ref effect on undead or constructs. All right, so third level, we so we're like a monk paladin, right? We get uh, we get a key use that is kind of like a lay on hands. Oh, you like my voice? I'm I'm glad. You know, it's it's one of those things that at first when you're hearing yourself, if you're watching a VOD or a YouTube playback, and you say, I, s I sound like that? Oh, I don't know. That's kind of... Do I... Is that what people hear? And I did that for a little while. And I finally realized, you know what? I talk all the time in my store. People don't mind. I, I can't say people have said I've had a magnificent voice in the store. But if I'm here, this is no different. As I present this channel, we're all sitting in a game store right now anyway, having some table talk. So, you know, I have a voice, own it. It's it's my voice. And you know what? If you don't like my... Uh, no, I'm, saying, I'm not saying any of you don't like it. But if you don't like it, that's not my problem. I'm here. I'm doing the best I can uh, to entertain, to educate, to have fun, to meet you all and learn. And so... Eh. <laughs> And, and then when you get that confidence behind your voice, it, it is reflected in it. It doesn't change your voice necessarily, but it might change your presentation in a way that makes you come across as more comfortable in this situation. And if I'm comfortable, I hope that you all feel comfortable as well. You know, you're welcome here. This is a place of learning and peace and you know, all that hippie stuff. <laughs> Moonbeams and butterflies, and you went to a local comic shop to see what their D and D selection was, um, and it was a small glass case. As far as like miniatures, or they only had the core rule books. Coffee, you think that your voice irks you? Well, if it irks you, then I, then I, th that, I guess that's up to you. I I don't have a problem with your voice at all. Uh, and I, I doubt anyone else uh, on Tuesday or otherwise, it, people who come to your channel do. Got a sealed box of Storm King's Thunder and Mad Mage uh, just to say I bought something. They didn't have books. So a, a little bit of inside baseball coffee. For some games, actually not even just for some, for many game stores, carrying role-playing games is a big risk. And the risk is role-playing games often do not have a high turnover. And so as a store, you spend a lot of money to invest in the product that is going to sit there for a while. And then when someone buys a book, such as the player's handbook, that's really all anyone needs to play D&D. &D. So you've held up, you know, whatever you paid for it at the store, depending on your, whatever, your wholesaler, or if you get it direct or whatever. And so you've had that money tied up in the inventory for weeks or months at a time, not moving. And when it finally does, not only are you presumed to replace that product, but that customer has the product that's all they need. And so you won't get a repeat sale from that customer. And so uh, there's other things like, you, you know, if you want to run or if you want to sell RPGs in your store... Oftentimes, people want to play at your store, which requires a lot of table space. Some comic and game stores don't have a lot of interior space. I'm very fortunate to have about 3,000, 3,500 square feet of space in the store. And a good chunk of that is uh, is play space. Um, so we can support it, right? Um, 
And uh, there's also a strong role play community, which means that my turnover on product is, you know, it, it makes it much more attractive to carry. So I also have uh, the vampire books and I'll be getting the Pathfinder books once uh, second edition comes out this summer. Um, so it's, it can be tough. You know, many game stores will make a custom order for you if you talk to them. Uh, but to upfront carry some supplies or, uh, you know, paints or minis or whatever, it can be kind of a scary thing for some businesses to do. Oh, it's more of a comic shop? Uh, that could explain it, too. The other store in town is more game-based and has Reaper minis, at least. Okay. Oh, Reaper minis are... Uh, Reaper makes good stuff. Uh, Wolfie, uh, is D&D &D stuff more based on the buyer, like an order thing? I'm not sure I understand, Wolfie. My one local store says Josh has literally only the new stuff, and when a release date for newer stuff gets announced, like the new edition or a new printing... They stop ordering the old version, and when the shipment, even if it's like a year and a half away, and they sell the old stuff that's being replaced at cost. Oh, wow, that's an interesting model. That store isn't on your way home. Oh. The player's handbook is a slippery slope, a gateway drug. Next thing you know, you've got 217 sets of dice, dwarven forged terrain, and your snorting lines of uh, PLA dust from your 3D printer. <laughs> Oh, GM Vault is uh, apparently in recovery, and is uh, this is this is one of the steps to recovery is telling other people not to go down this path. Yeah, that's a very interesting business decision, Josh. Oh, I answered it in the long talk. Gotcha. DMs. I went to the local game store yesterday since I didn't have my appointments, and they had a nice selection of minis. Uh, and that's also when you got those cool dice, too. That's another thing. Uh, kind of like what GM Vault said. That's as a that's as a consumer, as a player, or as a DM. As a store, if you start carrying it, it also escalates in a similar fashion. If any of you have seen interior pictures of the store in the D&D &D selection, or like the role, play, uh, the role play section of the wall, it's grown, and it's actually too big for its own location right now. Uh, we're going to actually be taking out some showcases and building extra shelves uh, just for the D&D &D stuff because it's it keeps growing. Plus, I'm also um, I'm bringing uh, Warhammer back online in the store, too. So there's going to be some racks uh, for paints and all that other stuff. Um, Age of Sigmar 40K. Ah, uh, there you go. A little insider baseball on uh, on owning and running a game store, everyone. All right, so we get a lay on hands type ability. Seeker the Light. At third level, whenever you hit a creature with one of the attacks granted by your flurry of blows, you can choose to make each fiend monstros. Ooh, a monstrosity or undead within 30 feet of you make a wisdom saving throw. If the creature fails its saving throw, it is turned for one minute or until it takes damage. A turned creature must spend its turns trying to move as far away from you as it can, and it can't willingly move to a space within 30 feet of you. All right, so this is this is uh, as per um, this is as per turning. Uh, once you use this feature, can't use it again until you finish a long rest. You can use this feature twice between long rests starting at 11th level. That is interesting that they have monstrosity. That makes it very unique. Because really, the only deviant from this kind of ability is the Ancients, Oath of the Ancients Paladin, that turn fiends and fey. Whereas the others are fiends and undead, or specifically turn undead. So this, this is a cool, interesting little niche, right? You're protecting people from monsters. Yeah, so GM Vault, because of the nature of a store investing in role-playing games, you're, you're going to find that. Where stores try and carry it, it might fail. And so it, it becomes kind of a, a natural like osmosis or patchwork of stores. That a store is known for RP stuff, 
and then the stores around it don't feel like they should invest in it because this one specializes in it and the other ones, the books are gonna collect dust or whatever else. Uh, and so it turns into something where people drive to get to the RP store. When I was doing a, a survey for the store a couple years ago, on average, uh, people drove about that far who weren't, are, like about half of the people that came into the store were from out of town. And my, the average driving range was about 45 miles for the out of town customers. So between the, the, the outer town limits and about 45 miles away, um, we drew people in. Half an hour, 45 minutes is, uh, is about that. You have to drive 30 minutes, Rykon? Hey, Victor, welcome. Guess how many dwarf campaigns gob... Guess how my dwarf campaigns goblin arc ended. Oh, yeah, you had a couple options uh, for that, depending on the decisions that they made. Uh, I, I I don't remember them offhand, Victor. You'll, you'll have to tell me how it ended. Uh, you certainly share your tale from the tabletop with us, though. The store you went in today is down the street from you. Better store is halfway between work and home, which is about a mile. It's more of a special trip for you. I can hit two good game stores, a half-price books, a craft store, and an art store, often a mile. Oh, man, that's a sweet spot then, GM. Oh, that is sweet. Uh, let's see. Wrath of the Argent. Beginning at 6th level, you can expend two key points to wreath your fists or monk weapons. Or monk weapons. Interesting. In sacred in a sacred flame. <laughs> For the next minute, your, your firsts. <laughs> so, not your fists, but your firsts. Put them up. Put them up. Alright, if there's an Eberron person watching this, we found a, a little typo for you. Um, you wreath your firsts or monk weapons in a sacred flame. For the next minute, your firsts shed... Ooh, there it is again. Shed bright light out to 10 feet and dim light up to 15 feet. In addition, your monk weapon attacks and unarmed strikes deal an extra 1d4 radiant damage. When you hit a fiend, monstrosity, or undead, the radiant damage increases to 2d4. And then at 17th level, uh, at Epic, you can spend four key points for a little bit more damage. Seems like a wide gap for not a ton of extra damage. And a heavy investment, right, of the four key points? Hmm. I wonder... Well, you get for a minute. And honestly, most combats are over in three or four rounds anyway, so a minute is generous. Um, it's cool that your monk weapons get to do that. And that could, uh, but, and so that could also account for darts. You know, it's not saying that you, it has to be a melee attack. These can be ranged attacks that you can put this onto as well. Interesting. I don't know, at 17th level, the four key points to increase the radiant damage to 2d4 is kind of, eh. Like, okay, it's an option, but what else could I be doing? It's, you know, an extra d4 at 17th level just feels feels kind of, I don't know. Yeah, it, it's per round, you know, for a minute. Maybe it's hitting vulnerabilities or something. I don't know. I, I feel like that one's kind of... The initial one is fine. It's six level, a little bit extra damage. Uh, it's guaranteed in there. You can use it every combat. It has utility because you can make your your firsts uh, light up. Um, at the seventeenth level, feels kind of blah though to me. Um, but hey, if any of you have like a, a reason in mind, like no, 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 this is actually balanced because you know there's all this other stuff going on, then enlighten me. Uh, get it? Because we're lighting up our firsts. Goblin Rebellion, battle at the main gate. The baddie ate a massive handful of mushrooms, tried to cast a level 9 fireball, failed the DC 23 wisdom check for casting a level 9 spell, and blew up in flames. Oh yeah, because that was a mechanic for you, is that your goblins could cast spells, but they, they had to eat a particular mushroom and pass a, uh, a save on it. So uh, the goblin itself became the fireball, effectively. 
Josh, hate to mess with the subject, but this randomly popped in my head. In my game, my players had to jump from the top of this tower into a canal. Sitting there, I had a canal system, almost like an underground Venice. And one player made a bad roll and landed in a gondola. I didn't damage him because it was a cool scene, but the gondolier scammed him out of a few silvers. Yeah, like, yeah, what's the matter you? Uh, damaging my boat. I need a compensation. I'll call for the guards. He did stand a chance. Well, but a chance is a chance, right, Victor? Hopefully everyone at the tabletop had fun with that scene, though. Oh, if you're going to be in my boat, you're going to pay for a ride. I, I love it. <laughs> it's like something, you, you like a corny line you'd get in an action flick. And I'm a sucker for that. When when I run D&D, &D, I, love, I love fun, you know, action lines. Uh, you know, kind, kind of dipping into the tropes. I mean, I enjoy presenting, you know, maybe fresh takes on things. But, you know, puns. Uh, scenes like that where we have a serious moment that suddenly then, ooh. The weak goblin that no one liked became the tribe leader and it was all good. And such, we have action and reaction. You know, we have action and consequence and the story and the world continue in an, in an interesting organic fashion. Uh, bound by faith, starting at 11th level, when you attempt to stun a fiend, monstrosity or undead with your stunning strike feature, you can instead expend an additional five key points to force the Tarje to make a wisdom saving throw or be paralyzed for up to a minute. The target repeats the saving throw each time it takes damage or at the end of each of its turns. On a success, the effect ends on the target. Five key points to have it be paralyzed. It says up to a minute. Does that mean that you could purposely drop it if you want? I mean, it can save against it, but when it says it uh, or be paralyzed for up to a minute. I guess that's just accounting for the fact it could save before the time limit. Each time it takes damage or at the end of each of its turns. Hmm. I mean, this definitely sets up a Nova round, right? You, uh, you know, wah! You stun the, you're, you stun the target, which then paralyzes it, and then that's gonna grant a whole slew of extra, you know, battlefield conditions. And it seems like that's when everyone gets together for. Well, in fourth edition, we called it a Nova round. At least at our tabletop, we did. I don't know if any of you who played fourth edition uh, had something along those lines. I think uh, what. In um, Trust of Flump, if you're still around, I don't know if you are, but uh, you had a different name for some. I think you all called it a murder circle or something, where everyone got together and said, all right, on three, we all stabbed the, ha the hapless target at the same time. You forgot to download your last session? Is it is it gone forever, or is it just, oh, great, I have to do this now kind of a thing? So I guess this is this is okay. I mean, it, it's great that it, it can improve stunning strike. The five key point costs. Well, you know what? It could end a fight. You might be spending five key points anyway. And if this is gonna if this is gonna set up this uh, this Nova round, if this is gonna end a fight, the five key points may be worth it. I mean, you get them back on a short rest anyway. Pardon. Or at least if they're paralyzed. Um, you know, if you have a way to quickly tie him up, because it does repeat it at damage or at the end of its turns. That's a big investment of key points, though, for something that could be um, that could be resisted um, very frequently. Uh, and at 17th level, when we become epic, Radiant Embrace. At 17th level, as an action, you stoke the embers within you into a torrent of holy fire. For one minute, you gain the following benefits. You radiate light as if you are the center of a daylight spell. Ooh, my. 
Uh, while you have at least one hit point, you regenerate hit points equal to your wisdom modifier at the start of each of your turns. Who? That... That is really good. And it doesn't make you invincible. It definitely will keep you... Well, I don't know. I mean, if you're if if you're dying, you don't get the regen. And if it's your modifier, if you have so you'd have like a five at most, unless there's something unnatural going on. Five hit points per turn. Maybe that's not. Um. Oh, it's as an action also. So never mind. That that's not overpowered at all. So over a minute, you'd get 50 hit points back. Well, nah, at 17th level, I don't know if that's necessarily bad. Your monk weapon attacks and unarmed strikes score critical hits on a 19 or 20. Against a fiend, monstrosity, or undead creature, you score critical hits with your monk weapon attacks and unarmed strikes on a roll of 18 to 20. So a 15% chance. Once you use this feature, you can't use it again until you finish a long rest. By 17th level, that does seem appropriate. Um, and you, you're locked in for a day, so you have to choose. I guess, yeah, I mean, the, 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 the daylight actually is going to be better than just light. So that might be worth it in a, in a different condition. I think I'm fine with the Radiant Embrace. Overall, I... I don't see that this is necessarily a, a bad subclass. Uh, it is definitely a mix of paladin and monk. And the fact that it can affect monstrosities is interesting because uh, that means that your, your dungeon master is probably going to be including a few more of those in your campaign. So have fun with them. Yeah, could be fun. Could, could, could be fun. No, that's not bad at all, Rykon. Oh, after Twitch's two-week limit? Oh, no, Josh. Well, hopefully you still have your notes and you can just kind of make like a filler, like, no, oh, this is what happened. Th this, is why, this is why I have OBS record my sessions, too, so I don't have to rely on Twitch. And, uh, Mata, thank you very much for the follow. Ooh. I'm curious. I am curious. We are at 994 followers. So close to a thousand. So close. One of your players constantly wants to be undead. Now they are against the Curse of Strahd. I'm testing their spirit. Curse of Strahd is a lot of fun. All right, let's take a look at at, uh, at the Paladin. <laughs> I would like to stream and record at the same time, but OBS records it as an FLV, which is harder to cut stuff out of if I need to. Can't you, can't you tell it to save in a different format? Yep, so close, Wolfie. Ah, almost there. Let's go to Paladin. Couple paragraphs that describe the, the general Paladin under general presumptions. And now let's take a deeper look at it. Throughout folklore and legend, Paladins have been celebrated as champions of light since Miramir, or Tiramirin saved Thrain with her sword and her sacrifice. Often more militant than holy, these warriors seem bound to the outer worldly beings that guide them more than any other allegiance. And there have even been reports of these vital military assets defying the nations they champion to serve those voices only they can hear. If a Paladin's alliance can shift at a whim, what separates them from simple mercenaries for the highest bid of power? This thesis explores the faith and faithfulness of Paladins throughout history and their role in modern times. So here we are, we're in religion. 1104, Faith and Folklore. A paladin is a champion empowered by faith, 
And a paladin's oath is a symbol of is a symbol of that faith and a source of guidance in dark or confusing times. Problems are rarely simple, and so those too rigid might shatter against the complexities of a noir tale in Eberron. Faith needn't be blind, and like the paladin, it should evolve. Tiramirin founded the Church of the Silver Flame, but she began as a paladin of Dol Ara, discovering the Silver Flame and her destiny over the course of her adventures. A soldier has a cause and a purpose, but a paladin is bound by sacred oath. Don't be afraid to explore these trappings and, should the story present the right reasons, abandon them. Remember, Eberron isn't just a generic setting. It has a theme. It has story elements it wants to present, and the Eberron content is supposed to encourage those elements. Um, so, depending on the pantheon here, um, these are where you would find the different oaths falling to the different gods. Uh, including, by the way, because uh, there is uh, some oaths in Xanathar's Guide to Everything and Xanathar's Lost Notes. There is a lot of lore and more fluff in here. Again, I, I highly suggest you read it, enjoy it, immerse yourself in Eberron, but I don't want to spoil that for you here. There's context for the, the class questions and the subclass presentation. Grimvex, howdy to you. You can set it to record as uh, an MP3. Additionally, you can download, export it afterwards. I do that for my campaign, says Mata. You can, but MP4 is tricky with OBS if you crash. In most cases, OBS will also let you stop a recording without stopping the stream. Uh, so your after session table talk can be left out of the recording. Ex uh, yeah, coffee, that's what I do. Um, because I don't have the time. I, I have the skill. I don't have the time to edit videos because uh, I, I have PowerDirector. Um, my video editing consists of pressing the record button in OBS when I'm ready to record. And I cut my videos by hitting stop record. <laughs> Um, after the Goblin Arc was over, I ran some random things in the side RP channels, including a long dead Necro's Den with some flesh reavers and a farmer and a farmer fiend that ate cattle in exchange for good crops. I need to develop more subclasses. Might get this to help organize and stylize it. Yeah, Wolfie, I, there's a lot of solid stuff in here. I, I'm enjoying it. Mata says that's true, but there are a, a few perfect paths. I recommend streaming using Streamlabs or something that can give you an easier time streaming, then download and export it through Twitch. Just did an entire session with no combat and everyone had a good time. What's going on? Blargle! That's great. I love no combat sessions. I mean, combat sessions are great and entertaining, but I love no combat sessions as well. Um, although, you know, I personally feel that uh, this past Tuesday's game was, uh, I don't know, I tried my best to present something, and I had content I was really eager uh, for everyone to get involved in and, and to go to, and um, I don't know. I don't know. You know, off games happen, but it's really been eating me all week. Shopping episodes, yeah, <laughs> Rikon. Shopping episodes, beach episodes, you know, fun downtime, or even I love running combats where no dice are rolled. My players enjoy shopping sessions uh, to see my homebrew stuff. Yeah, oh, I know. It, it, shopping is... It, it's not necessarily brought up, or it's, it's just sort of rolled into downtime activities, but shopping is a lot of fun in this game. Now, where this document, uh, again, shines, it challenges you to think about what does it mean to be a paladin, and can you have a paladin that's not just, I believe in this god, and I will follow this god, and I will be lawful good to the X X X X extreme eem, eem. And, you know, you can run a paladin like that. That's a, you know, a fun way to run a paladin for many, some. Um, but question it. What's the source of your oath? Why did you make it? Faith can be categorized best by a confidence or trust that is not based on proof, and in displaying such a confidence, one's gifts might originate with no doctrine or religion, but rather a belief in an idea, a system, or even oneself. 
A cruel paladin might claim to be the herald of the morning, or be driven purely by the concept of justice at any cost. There are Warforged who serve the Becoming God, a deity the Warforged are creating from an idea, just as they themselves were created. Theologians, uh, theologians debate whether such paladins are drawing power from the plains, or whether they might be granted power by other gods and theorize the Traveler endows such outliers to spread chaos in the world. Regardless, it's entirely plausible to craft a faith around a paladin as opposed to matching the champion to an existing religion. Yes, yes, yes. You have a combat hungry player in your game. Last session was an RP entry session. She did not have the most fun. Not everyone will in every session. Combats aren't guaranteed. Social encounters aren't guaranteed. Skill challenges, shopping trips, downtime. So everyone will get their time to shine, you know, when they when they get around to it. I would enjoy a time for our players to RP and engage in less combat encounters, but few times do they negotiate politely. They decided not to pay the red brand ruffian tax, and upon return had a bit of a beatdown. As for the paladin question, all my characters are conflicted, but focus on the extreme of good. It's easy to be neutral, it's hard to convince uh, others and yourself you're on the right path when so much conflict comes from it. Since you use your own pantheon as ancient gods, and use D&D gods as lesser, you get a lot of social encounters with worshippers that have different outlook. I, I love all these stories y'all are telling about your interpretations, the way that you run it at your tabletop, because all of these are si are simultaneously a great way to run. There's not just one, and that's the I, I love storytelling because of that. So the origins of faith, uh, this is giving you a, a dive into, you know, in Eberron, what, what does it mean to be a paladin, right? A paladin's journey is so remarkable that most inhabitants of the world can't possibly fathom the thought and one that few adventure, adventurers will truly comprehend. For example, you don't have to be proficient in the religion skill and might know absolutely nothing about divinity at all. Perhaps you'll encounter skeptics who don't believe your story and your inclination could present as a thirst for such knowledge or an air of insecurity shrugged off as indifference. Maybe you'll suffer fools who attempt to provoke you to defy the tenets of your oath by claiming you a false prophet or blasphemer, even if you know that you are empowered directly by the sovereigns or the silver flame. Will you agree to your ignorance or attempt to convince the unbelievers by word or sword? After all, you were chosen and you've got work to do. Um, have you been called to serve? Is this devoted service? Is this uh, dramatic inspiration? And, uh, do you have an unspoken vow? These are all thinking prompts that if you get this document, please read through it. This is all stuff that'll help shake up, you know, shake off the notion, uh, polish your paladin, so to speak. If you think that paladin is just this monochromatic, uh, a paladin is this paladin is a paladin is a paladin, Use this as a way to freshen up your concept of a paladin. All right, so let's explore now the Oath of Sacrament. The Sacrament of Blood is one of the central rituals in the Blood of Vol. Members of the community gather, and each sheds a few drops of blood into a chalice. The faithful believe that there is a divine spark in the blood, though uh, through this ritual, the faithful are recognized are recognizing their shared divinity and affirming their connection to one another. Death is oblivion, but life itself is divine, and all of the faithful are bound by blood. A paladin who takes the oath of sacrament harnesses the divine power in their own blood and uses that gift to defend those they care about. Such a paladin cares little for honor or honesty and sees no need to protect every innocent. Reality is vast and cruel, or cruel, and some people deserve to end in oblivion, but friends and family are precious and the paladin will guard them to the bitter end. The tenets of a sacrament, or of sacrament. The tenets of the oath of sacrament drive a paladin to be a champion of life and a bringer of death. The multiverse is harsh, uh, this is the mastery of life tenet. The multiverse is harsh and unforgiving. 
If gods exist, they are distant, their power is limited, or their attention is simply cruel. Within you lies a spark of divinity, and it calls you to share its warmth. Mastery of self, you follow the path of no greater being. Your journey is that of a steady hand, thoughtful care, and decisive action. Transcend your mortal beginnings, prove yourself worthy of the faith others place in you, and guide their way. And mastery of death. Death is a tool like any other. It is yours to unleash, but do so wisely only to, the, only to tip the scales when necessary and preserve the balance that wars within all things. So we're still going to be a half caster. We're going to get oath spells uh, and aura. Um, well, let's delve into it here. Uh, Mata agrees. I have a paladin concept that asks for the power to not die in a battle. Whomever answered, he would devote his belief and strength towards, giving the DM a chance to play a deity, and for me to be pushed toward religion, good, neutral, or evil, the DM's choice. Wolfie likes orc paladins. Raycon, your dragons are good. Sorry, I'm, I'm catching up in chat here real quick. Let's see what you get. False Life, Zephyr Strike, and that is out of Xanathar's Guide. Alter Self, Enhance Ability, interesting. Feign Death, Vampiric Touch, Death Ward, Sickening Radiance, Anti-Life Shell, and Enervation. So this is going into, I don't know, kind of Dark Knight in a Final Fantasy terms. You're not an Oathbreaker in terms that you are an evil necromancer sort of paladin. Um, but you have these other abilities. I mean, you, some might consider them darker. I mean, or maybe like necromantic, but not necessarily like, yes, all the undead. But this is definitely about the the preservation of yourself so that you can then go on to influence others. A strong neutral stance from how it seems. When you take this oath at third level, you gain the following two uh, Chan Div options. Sacrament of Blood. As an action, you can use your channel divinity to expend a number of hit dice up to your proficiency bonus to strengthen your allies and weaken your enemies. Roll the dice and add them together. Living creatures you choose within 30 feet of you, including you, regain hit points equal to the total, while undead creatures you choose within that same area take force damage equal to... So that way you can hit ghosts. Uh, take force damage equal to the same amount. Hmm. It's a good crowd control tactic for a paladin, which paladins traditionally don't have crowd control. Turn the suffering. When you roll a saving throw at the end of your turn to end one spell or effect on yourself, you can use your Chan Div to automatically succeed on that saving throw and push the effect to those around you. Each creature within 10 feet must succeed on the, sa on the saving throw specified in the description of the spell or effect against your spell save DC or immediately be affected by it. The effect lasts a number of rounds equal to your charisma modifier. Each creature can repeat its saving throws at the end of each of its turns. On a success, the effect ends. So, all right, ooh, you got to be careful then. Because <laughs> uh, if you want to overcome, I don't know. Uh, oh, geez. Um, let me find it. Yeah, a ghost horrifying visage. Each non-undead creature within 60 feet of the ghost that can see it must succeed on a DC 13 wisdom saving throw or be frightened for a minute. If the save fails by five or more, the target also ages 1d4 times 10 years. 
<laughs> um. Oh, I guess that's to end. So. I was going to say, you could, like, accidentally instantly age your party members, like, 40 years, uh, because it hits you and you say, no, not today, and suddenly the, the age acceleration just bursts 10 feet all around you to all your party members who are trying to crowd around you to, to take advantage of your aura. <laughs> oh, gosh. Anyone think I should do something special for my players Monday night? It's April Fool's Day. Um, you, you could tell them, hey, you know what? Usually you all buy me pizza as the DM, and I appreciate it. So on Monday night, I'm going to buy you all pizza. And then it just turns out that, like, in-game they get a pizza, not actual, like, physical pizza. But then you could order them pizza afterwards, after the joke's been played. Thai food is fine, too. Um, you know, talking about paladins and all this, in at this stage in the world that I've been running for quite a long time now, uh, it's monotheistic, so there's not even a pantheon, um, and so you know you can say, well, how do domains and, and oaths work? They do, and they work very well. <laughs> See, well, that's why you buy them pizza in character. You deliver their characters pizza. Aura of Inner Strength. Starting at 7th level, whenever you are a friendly creature within 10 feet of you makes a strength or constitution ability check, the creature gains a bonus to the check equal to your Charisma modifier. Minimum 1. You must be conscious to grant this bonus at 18th level and extends to 30 feet. Not bad. Strength and con don't happen often. Con, con for sure can come in handy. Uh, con saves are against like necromancy and acid and a lot of other, a lot of other really nasty stuff. Strength can be useful for forced movement, and that can be very good so that you don't get blown off a cliffside or something. Oh wait, that's a that's an ability check, not a save. You are a friendly creature that intends to make a strength or constitution ability check. Okay, all right. So hang on, it's not a save. Oh, you know what? That's because the the normal paladin is charisma to all saves. That's why. So this is that's why this is just specifically for ability checks, so they can maintain their constitution. <laughs> Or uh, you're sort of giving him that rally cry. Yeah, go climb that wall. Uh, Godless Dogma. Starting at 15th level, your Stoic Resolve allows you to persist against the agents of above and below. Your proficiency bonus is doubled for saving throws against spells and effects that deal necrotic or radiant damage. And you have resistance to radiant and necrotic damage. Oof. That's, that's really solid. Coffee Cat, you say that it is sleep time, and so Coffee Cat is going to bed just as the other Tricy. Uh, so we're, we're losing a creative cat or a, a Coffee Cat comics, and now we are obtaining a, cre a creative creature, Carla. So welcome. Uh, have a good night, Coffee, and welcome to you and everyone else, Carla. Uh, what were you up to tonight? Yeah, have a great night, Coffee. And finally, the capstone here for our Paladin subclass. As you do get, like, your capstone comes uh, from your uh, from your subclass. All right, cleansing touch. This is uh, this is the last thing you get as a Paladin. Everything else is off of your Sacred Oath. 
Yep, you're switching in. So, uh, creative creature Carla comes like, ah, tag me in. Ooh. And Coffee Cat, you know, boom, zooms out to bed. And we now have uh, Carla et al. Welcome, welcome. You have become a selfless champion of perseverance and a pillar for the downtrodden. Starting at 20th level, whenever you cast a spell that targets a single creature that damages or restores hit points to it, you can use your reaction to expend a number of hit dice up to half your proficiency bonus. Roll those dice and add the total to the healing or damage of your spell. Uh, as an important note, they should indicate here if it is round up or round down. Because there are instances, depending on the circumstances, that it is one or the other. So if anyone, you know, is watching uh, from, you know, a creative team or if someone knows to get a hold of it or just to write an email, please make sure they indicate uh, that it, how you round it. Is it rounded up or down? And does it have to be any hit dice if you're multiclassing? Or do you need to specify, which I think they do, that it should be Paladin hit dice? Sketching some ideas for Prince and then worked on some bad people? Oh, I'm sorry I missed it, uh, uh, Carla, but I'll have to go and take a look if it's in a VOD. Round down instead, unless it states otherwise. Um, there could be a rule about that, but there are some instances where round down is explicitly stated and round up is explicitly stated. And so, because you have that, um, oh, Rikon, yes, Carla is working on some art for a, uh, only quasi-super secret thing that I'm doing. Uh, but Josh, because there are, are statements that expressly say round up or down, um, it, it wouldn't hurt necessarily to, uh, to throw that in there. Uh, and then to specify, uh, to specify that. Right. I don't know, for a capstone at level 20, this is... It seems okay. I mean, I guess you'll get to play around with it a little bit at 20th level, but there's not, you know, I don't know how much is going to be beyond that. But, um, so Absolution makes sense, kind of. Um, I, I don't see it as something that's like super, yes, I am the maximum paladin. Um... I mean, if you compare it to things like Holy Nimbus or Elder Champion and the things that you get here. Uh, this one seems kind of eh. I'll message you the pics as well. Yes, thank you. If you do check out the VOD, you'll hear my frog self as I've come down with some sort of plague. All right. Yeah, I I'd love to see it. If you want to uh, shoot him over in Discord or something to me, Carla, I'd, I'd super appreciate it. Let's see, so we have Ranger, Rogue, Sorcerer, Warlock and Wizard, we have five left. So why don't we do this, let's take Let's take another short break here. I'm going to get up and refresh myself. And we can continue exploring these subclasses. Uh, tonight, I'd like to make our way through... Uh, we've gone through Paladin. R Ranger and maybe Rogue? I don't know. We'll, we'll see how far that goes. Uh, you know, if any of them are going to require a deeper dive. Like, Druid needed a, a lot of talk because there was a lot of stuff in Druid that kind of was wonky to me. 
Um, but we've been having a pretty good time so far. I showed that soon, BRB. Yep, yep. Uh, do what you got to do, Carla. I'm going to go take a five-minute break myself, and we'll come back and, and continue doing what we're doing here. <laughs> 